after being postponed for a year. Euro 2020 begins this week. I would have called it Euro 2021, but it's up to them. Alongside drama on the pitch, we already have an idea of what political controversies will accompany this tournament. In England's warm-up match on Sunday against Romania, all players took the knee in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and a bunch of fans booed. Now, we're not going to show you direct footage of that moment because whenever we show you clips of football, the stream gets taken down. Instead, here's a video uploaded by a man watching in his living room. I mean, that was a hilarious video, but I mean, it's obviously a, a very serious topic. Jason, I want to bring you in on this. What did you make of the booing? Were you surprised, disappointed? What's your reaction? I mean, I'm not really a football fan, but I know that in the kind of like England fan base kind of conducts itself like the social wing of the British Army or something. And it, my understanding is that, you know, both here and in other countries, whenever there's a kind of like English football victory or there's a match of some sorts, you know, they go around singing two World Wars, one World Cup. And then they have the audacity to say, you know, keep politics out of football when people decide to take a knee um, to mark their respect. So, you know, of course, it's not surprising at all. I've heard lots of people, you know, talk about the poppy and stuff when they say, oh, people who say you should take football out of politics out of football, then what about the poppy? The, the, the two World Wars, one World Cup is a very good example. And let's go to England manager Gareth Southgate. He had a really strong response, actually, I think. Let's take a look. Well, the first thing is that, you know, we are collectively really disappointed that it happened. Um, I think you have to put yourself in the shoes of a young England player about to represent his country. And because we're all trying to support, move for equality, move for um, supporting our own teammates, some of the experiences they have been through in their lives. Um, some people decide to boo. I think those people should put themselves in the shoes of those young players and how that must feel. And if that was their children, if they're old enough to uh, have children, how would they feel about their, their kids being in that sort of situation? So the most important thing for our players is to know that we are totally united on it. We're totally um, committed to supporting each other, supporting the team. Um, we feel that more than ever, determined to take the knee through this tournament we accept that there might be an adverse reaction and we're, we're just going to ignore that and move forward I think the players are, are, are sick of talking about the consequences of should they shouldn't they they've had enough really now that to me was exactly right he's saying they're doing it in solidarity with victims of racism including you know racism experienced by the players themselves and he's saying it's something the whole team believes in it's non-negotiable I'm not here um, to you know listen to and weigh up the arguments we've had this conversation within the team we're all agreed we'll be taking the knee and if that boils your piss so be it obviously he didn't use quite those words now someone whose piss was boiled um, by Southgate's defense of his players um, was Nigel Farage let's take a look at his response Gareth Southgate doesn't seem to understand that the BLM movement is not only Marxist but divisive too England fans will hate this. They just want to watch a game of football. Calling the Black Lives Matter movement Marxist or anyone who takes the knee or supports the Black Lives Matter movement um, Marxist has become a bit of a meme on Britain's far right. In fact, I think Marxist was trending last night precisely because of this. Now, obviously, on this show, we don't think there's anything wrong with being a Marxist. In fact, we think it's, it's, it's pretty cool. But a response from many people who who take the knee or who are in support of this action to say that it's kind of implausible to suggest that these millionaire footballers by taking the knee are endorsing some sort of Marxist ideology. And this is a much simpler symbol of solidarity against racism. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And, you know, that video of Gareth Southgate, like he's really quite emotional about it. And what I get the sense of is that 
they he wasn't quite prepared for this level of backlash and hostility. Um, that's because you know I've I've said this before, but I think that the Black Lives Matter movement at large at the moment was built and is still built on quite an unstable coalition because you have people who just think you know I don't want my teammates to you know throwing bananas at and you I don't want the audiences to be making chip noises like they've done at some black football players. And then you do have Marxists. You do absolutely have Marxists. You do have people who view um, anti-racism as the work of undoing racial capitalism. And so when it comes to whether or not, you know, people should embrace, you know, Marxism or not, you know, I'm all for people embracing Marxism and these ideologies. And it's obviously ridiculous, um, you know, to claim that, you know, um, these football, England football players are Marxists at all, considering their wealth portfolios. Um, but I think it's it's interesting to work through the kind of contradictions and tensions and what's also being conflated as well. Um, because of the actual institution Black Lives Matter UK, um, which does define itself as Marxist, which does define itself as pro-Palestinian, or at least, you know, it has members who are Marxists and is, you know, incredibly more radical. Because this is seen as the more kind of like radical end of BLM and because it uses the name BLM, it's always used as the kind of front um, within the right-wing press. It's always said, you know, any reference to BLM is therefore invoking this very specific organisation and its specific operations and ideologies. Um, that's not to, you know, make any kind of condemnation myself of the ideologies and the kind of motives of BLM, but it is being conflated with general support for, you know, at least the sentiment Black Lives Matter. And so it's kind of made the term kind of like unsayable without, you know, you basically pledging that, you know, you align yourself with Karl Marx and you align yourself with communism and you align yourself with this kind of dismantling of the state. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Whether or not people should embrace it, I mean, if footballers want to redistribute their wealth, I'm, you know, very open to that. I mean, Marcus Rashford, um, top the philanthropy list, I think it was something like that in the Times. Um, so, you know, I, I don't see a particular issue with that. I think that football um, can be like an inherently politicised sport, particularly because, you know, it's populated by so many working class boys who come through through raw talent. Um, but yeah, a lot of people found themselves in a really kind of sticky situation. And I think that an interesting example of this, you know, moving away from football even, say, for example, Pretty Little Thing, Boohoo, all those companies like that, we last year came out with their kind of shoddy Black Lives Matter statements and said, you know, we're in solidarity with Black communities and we're going to start supporting Black businesses and things like that and then I think like a month later the story about the Leicester factory workers broke and it was found that they were exploiting um, immigrants um, majority you know um, South Asian women and garment workers and it's like that very chain of exploitation the fact that they're subcontract subcontracting to infinity to the point where you know these women were being paid poverty wages is entirely counter to the principles of Black Lives Matter, as you know, most people understand them. Um, it's not just about you know treating people nice and you know not saying racist things to people. It's also about the working conditions of you know people of color and black people. It's also about the conditions that place us closest to death as well. And so these different you know corporations and these different brands can't quite understand that actually they can't declare you know make these statements about Black Lives Matter when they are not just complicit but when they are literally running the machinery. Um, which is placing people's lives closer and closer to danger and closer and closer to death. And that's not a, really a charge that I can make of the England football team or the England football players or something like that, because it's not a corporation in that sense. But uh, it's interesting. I, I kind of think, you know what, this is what you guys are signing up for. And I, I almost kind of like the challenge. I mean, obviously, it's it's difficult for the black football players and, you know, they are kind of bearing the brunt of that. But it's also very interesting to see white people actually kind of draw in and seeing that actually, if you want to make the stand and say, you know, oh, I want to support my colleague because he's getting racist abuse, you might also want to look at this entire spectrum of, you know, oppression and action which is happening outside because, you know, as much as, you know, what's happening to a, you know, fellow football player on the pitch is, you know, condemnable, that black football player was also not the kind of ground zero. He's also not the most oppressed person in the context of... Um, the kind of like food chain of, you know, who's being fucked over by the state and who's not. So I I think maybe perhaps it could help some of these footballers to kind of like stop and thinking, you know, why is the reaction so aggressive if it's just about, you know, how we treat people to think actually beyond that. And um, perhaps we can start to see the in the football teams become more politicised. I would be quite interested in seeing that. It might um, invigorate an interest in football, which I don't have at the moment. Well, it's interesting you say that because it does seem that in this situation, once again, they found themselves on the other side of a political debate with the prime minister. So the, the previous obvious example here um, was Marcus Rashford campaigning for free school meals over um, the summer holidays. And Boris Johnson eventually had to back down on that particular issue. I think 
eventually in autumn, there was a period where there weren't freeze cool meals over the holidays because in that period of time, Boris Johnson didn't back down, obviously. Completely outrageous. He didn't. It didn't make him look particularly good. But on this one, again, he seems to be saying, look, these footballers might think one thing, I think another. The Prime Minister's spokesman refused to condemn the fans booing. So it's obviously very different to what Gareth Southgate was saying. Gareth Southgate saying it was very disappointing to hear, to hear them boo. The Prime Minister refuses to condemn it. On whether or not the Prime Minister supported taking the knee, the spokesperson said, the Prime Minister has spoken on the record on this issue before. On taking the knee specifically, the Prime Minister is more focused on action rather than gestures. We have taken action with things like the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities, and that's what he's focused on delivering. You know, Boris Johnson is almost, in a way, taking on the language of, of the radical left by saying, I'm not interested in symbolism, I'm interested in action. But then his example of action is the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities, which was pretty much written off as just an exercise in saying racism doesn't exist. And at the same time, what I want to know is, do you think this is a mistake for the Prime Minister to constantly find himself on the other side of political debates with footballers, who are obviously some of the most popular, influential people in, in the country? Or do you think this is you know, potentially an intentional strategy, a bit like Donald Trump and, 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 and players in, in American football? I feel that actually quite strategically, Boris Johnson tends to keep his interventions in the cultural to a minimum, um, all things considered. I think that you tend to hear from Robert Jenrick or um, from Oliver Dalden more. And, you know, on the kind of statement of, you know, um, I'm more into action over justice. I mean, it, it is a case of, you know, kind of co-opting the language of, you know, like radical anti-racism and of the left and, you know, kind of co-opting that idea of, you know, I'm not about the superficial and the excesses of it. Um, but then the action that ends up getting taken is, you know, by redefining what he considers to be racism. And with the commission on, you know, race and ethnic disparities, I think that's something that was kind of like missing from a lot of the public discussion from that was that it's attempting to shift away the definition of racism from anything institutional, anything that implicates government, um, anything which implicates our prisons or our education system to look at individuals and individual liberty. Um, in a sense of, you know, autonomy and self-determination, because that's the kind of language of this government about, you know, levelling up, about helping, you know, individuals kind of unlock their powers. And um, so when the Conservative Party, you know, at large starts speaking about racism, they talk in defence of, say, Preeti Patel or Kemi Badenoch by people saying, you know, they're kind of forced to think in one way or they're being, you know, disciplined by the left and by other minorities because they're conservatives and because there's, you know, this kind of perceived incompatibility between being conservative and being a black or brown person. And so that the focus is kind of there. And so I imagine the kind of action that he imagines is that, you know, he's going to appoint some black secretaries of state or things like that. That's action for Boris Johnson. Action for him is, you know, taking kids out of prison for, you know, minor weed offences. Like, action for him isn't actually, you know, implementing a comprehensive public health strategy um, for knife crime in um, London, for example. Um, it's all about benefiting those around him and kind of enabling a kind of like black and brown Toryism and enabling this kind of share in the capitalist pie um, for certain black and brown people. That's action for him. On whether it's wise for him to be kind of boring football as well, since we have no seriously functioning opposition at the moment, I mean, he seems to be getting away with it. You'd think that going up against, you know, Marcus Rashford, who's a very popular footballer, would be something which would massively dent his popularity. And I think that, you know, from Dominic Cummings' testimony, it was, you know, revealed that his advisors were saying, you know, you don't want to pick on a fight with um, Marcus Rashford. Um, but I think that what's kind of aided Boris in this sense is that, you know, he's meant to be seen as this political figure. And the way Marcus Rashford's campaign was run was to make sure that it was, you know, party neutral and political neutral. It's about the whole idea of, you know, it's not politics. It's just about, you know, feeding kids and it's about, you know, benevolence and things like that. And, you know, he has to do that because of charity law, because if you're working with charities, you can't be explicitly political partisan. Um, but then to the kind of wider public, it does mean that it becomes, somehow it becomes depoliticised in their heads. Um, it's kind of more seen as, you know, a kind of dispute that's taken to task and a kind of like celebrity philanthropic influence um, rather than a kind of like real interrogation of government and the very basis of government and the very basis of how this conservative government works. Um, you know, it should be, you know, the um, Labour Party kind of defining the ideology of the conservatives and how they're operating right now and the reason why um, Marcus Rashford's campaign, whilst it can't explicitly state itself as political, but is necessary because of the consequences of the past 11 years of Tory austerity. Um, but where the fuck are they? <laughs> so, yeah, he's getting away with that. 
where the fuck are they is, is a good place to finish that segment on um obviously a reference as a reference to the labor party the footballers they are actually um standing up to be counted mm-hmm.